Let's turn our attention now <clears throat> to God's Word. If you have your Bible uh, with you, please open it to Acts chapter 26. And we'll be in verses 1 through 11 this morning. And we come to this part 2 of Paul's testimony here. and We've called this section the Gospel in Chains, as Paul boldly professes the gospel of Jesus Christ as he is literally in chains as a prisoner in Caesarea. Here are these words of this poem you'll be familiar with. First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a, train, a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Probably have heard that before. This poem was written by Martin Niemöller. And uh, so I want to give you the, you may not know the history of that poem. Martin Niemöller was a German Christian who at first was an anti-Semitic Nazi sympathizer. He supported the cause of the Nazis in the 1920s and thought that Hitler and the Nazis would improve the lives of of ordinary people. On occasion, he would meet with Hitler and discuss religion, but never politics. Hitler came to power in 1933, and when Niemöller met with him in 1934, he began to see the Nazi state as a dictatorship. Although he had never criticized the treatment of Jews, when he spoke out against the government's interference in religious matters, he was arrested and released several times. But in 1937, he was arrested and held without trial for eight months. Immediately upon his release, he was rearrested and he was held in two different concentration camps until the end of World War II in 1945. It was in the concentration camp that his views changed, undergoing horrific treatment uh, along with Jews and gay men and alcoholics and other undesirables. He wrote his famous poem. He recognized his sin and began to preach Christ in prison. He recognized that it was that that. It was sinful for him you know, to see the mistreatment of other human beings and remain silent because it was not happening to him. He had a lower view of some humans. So he recognized this. He repented and he began to preach Christ in prison. When the war was over, he came to America to speak of the horrors of the Nazi prison. But the central theme of his speech was Jesus Christ. After his speech, one reporter commented to another disgustedly, Imagine nine years in a Nazi prison and all he can talk about is Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great testimony? All he could talk about is Jesus Christ. Well, in our text today, we have Paul. Two years in a, a Caesarean prison. And all he could talk about, all he could ever talk about, was Jesus Christ. Paul took everything that happened to him and took every opportunity, and no matter where he was or what the situation was, he turned that opportunity, uh, he turned that situation into an opportunity to talk about Jesus. 
there was a man who was a great and bold witness for Christ, and he was asked what turned him around to become this bold witness. And he said that what turned his life around was a prayer that he prayed. And the prayer was this, that God would enable him to either, if he was given the opportunity to introduce the topic of conversation, that it would be about Jesus. Or if he was in any conversation, that God would give him the ability to take that conversation and turn it so that he could talk about Jesus. And so he found a way to always take the conversation and redirect it to Christ so that he could share the gospel and the good news of Jesus wherever he was, whatever the situation. And he probably prayed this because he saw the example and the testimony of Paul and that this was what Paul did. There was never an opportunity lost. So Paul is going to testify once again of Christ crucified and risen. Now Paul could have just made this all about himself and advocating for his release from false imprisonment and his mistreatment of, you know, of being treated harshly for committing no crime at all. But no, Paul was more concerned with the souls of those whom he was speaking to than he was of his own comfort. He was more concerned with the souls of Agrippa and Bernice and Festus and all of the uh, army, the soldiers, and all of those, all of the others that were with him, he was more concerned with their souls and of preaching Jesus than he was of gaining his own release. And so we're going to look at these verses this morning, verses one through eleven, and we'll have see these three points. This is our outline this morning. We're going to see in verses one through three the preface to Paul's profession. In verses 4 through 8, we'll see Paul's pious pedigree. And then in the final verses, 9 through 11, we'll see Paul as a previous persecutor. And so it's uh, so that we we get his whole testimony and we uh, have the whole context in mind. We're going to read um, all of chapter 26 of Acts this morning. And so if you will, if you have your Bibles open, you may follow along there, beginning at Acts chapter 26 and verse 1, Luke writes, under the inspiration of the Spirit, Agrippa said to Paul, you're permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially... Uh, because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you, listen to me patiently. So then all the Jew- so, so then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain. And as they earnestly serve God night and day, and for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them, often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them, even to foreign cities. While so engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, 
At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the, th to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the, domain, from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of His resurrection from the dead, He would be the first to proclaim light, both to the Jewish people, and to the Gentiles. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of, so of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. King stood up, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's examine our text this morning. And our first point is we see the preface to Paul's profession in verses 1 through 3. And so if we remember last week, we saw the grand entry of Agrippa and Bernice, their, their entry with trumpets sounding and, and all of the regalia uh, that, that came with it. And, and then Paul's humble entry in manacles, chained. Well, now Agrippa addresses Paul and gives him permission to speak. Uh, this is leading into the climax of the scene. One pastor describes the scene this way regarding Paul and Agrippa. Two men stand in confrontation. One stands as a prisoner. The other sits as a king. But one is an enslaved king, and the other is an enthroned prisoner. It is a fantastic scene. Well, our text today indicates that Paul considered himself fortunate the word means uh, grateful, glad, blessed, happy to have the opportunity to speak to Agrippa. Uh, 
And not just him, but to all of those that are present. Paul knows that he is addressing Agrippa, but he does not consider the others that are there as less important or secondary. Paul's speaking directly to Agrippa, but he's also speaking to all who are present. As we just read, verse 29, Paul said, And I wish to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul's purpose is not to gain his freedom, but theirs. His purpose is not to gain his freedom. His purpose is to bring freedom to them through faith in Christ. Freedom not from physical chains, but from the spiritual chains of sin. Paul may be the one that's literally in chains, but he is actually the only one there that is really free. The incestuous siblings, don't forget, Agrippa and Bernice, they may be enthroned, but they and all of their entourage are really the ones in chains along with Felix and all of his power. And they're in the worst kind of chains. They're in the invisible chains that that they cannot even feel the weight of. It's the most dreadful chains to be in. Chains that you don't even know that you're in. This is the sad case with those in the world today. They're enslaved by sin. And they don't even know it. We all have family and friends and uh, other loved ones and acquaintances that are in this predicament. And no matter what we say, no matter how clear and how powerfully we present the gospel to them, they just don't get it. As we read in 1 Corinthians 2 this morning, It's only the Spirit that can open their eyes and cause them to get it. And many times, though, we tend to think that if we could just say it this way, oh, if I would have just said it this way, if I would have just said it that way, if I'd have just done something differently, they'd believe. Be careful that you not put yourself in the place of God, in the Spirit. It's ours to proclaim the gospel. It's His calls them to believe. The reality is that someone else's salvation has nothing to do with our presentation or our persuasiveness. The Bible says that they're dead in their transgressions and sin. Dead. Now, I've said in many church services, especially growing up and hearing, especially hearing a visiting evangelist come and, and, and present the gospel and, and be very persuasive. You know, and, and the same people, I mean, we, we sit with uh, 150 people all year long and uh, no response to the, to the preaching. But then an evangelist comes, and he's very persuasive, and and half of these hundred people will get saved. They'll pray the prayer because he was very persuasive. But they're really, all they've done is prayed a prayer. He was persuasive. He caused them to move, but the Spirit had not worked. They're dead and their transgressions and sins. Response to the gospel is not merely an emotional response. If we're proclaiming the gospel to an audience who is lost and dead in their sins, dead, I remind you, how can you wake a dead man? How can you... How can I cause 
if we even think of it in the spiritual, in the physical realm, how can you wake a dead man? Can't, can we? No one else could have brought Lazarus from the grave. What did he need? He needed the breath of life. And it wasn't ours to give. But when Jesus called him, he rose. We cannot wake one who is spiritually dead. I remember hearing the reading the story of a pastor who preached a powerful message about the weight of sin and the burden of sin and, and how it weighs on us and it, and it drags us down and, 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 um, and we want to, to get rid of it and we, and, and we of ourselves, we just can't. And he was approached by a young man after the sermon and he said, Pastor, he said that message that you preached about the weight of sin, and he says, he says, I don't feel any of it. He says, I don't know what you're talking about, the weight of sin. And so then the pastor said, well, young man, if there were a corpse here lying on the floor, and I were to take a 400-pound weight and lay it on his chest, would he feel it? He says, well, no. Well, why not? Because he's dead. He says, precisely. We don't feel the weight of sin. Spiritually, we're dead. And no man, no man can breathe spiritual life into us. No man, no matter how persuasive, no matter how good of a gospel presentation he gives, can bring spiritual life. Those who are spiritually dead do not need to be awakened. They need the life breathed into them by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not controlled or coerced by any man's eloquent speech or persuasive arguments. We need the breath of life. Those who are, who are dead in sin, they're, they're, it's the illustration of Ezekiel chapter 37 in that valley of dry bones. And God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. Ezekiel said, well, Ezekiel said, Lord, can these, the Lord said, can these bones live? Well, Ezekiel did not presume upon God. His answer was, oh, Lord, you know. And he says, prophesy to these bones. And he did. And it says they began to feel uh, 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 there was a rattling. And then he said that uh, uh, the prophet prophesied that the spirit and may the Spirit move on them. And when, they, when the Spirit moved, they came to life. The spiritually dead do not need to be awakened. They do not need medicine. They're not just sick. They're spiritually dead. And this life, spiritual life, only comes through the life-giving Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. This truth, though, this truth that only the Spirit gives life, that our Gospel presentations, our persuasive words do not cause sinners to live, should not cause us to be careful about our witness. That, that one is not saved because of our presentation or our, our persuasive words, that shouldn't cause us, and that it's only by the Spirit, shouldn't cause us to be careless about our witness. We should strive to be able to present a very clear and concise gospel, and also able or to be knowledgeable enough to debate it and to answer questions about it, always ready to give a defense of the hope that is in us. Paul was always ready for this. But as we've seen in Paul's ministry, most of the people 
that he was able to preach Christ to, did not believe. Most of them did not believe. While this certainly saddened him, it did not discourage him. He proclaimed Jesus whenever and wherever he could. The fact that it was not his words that saved anyone did not cause Paul to think that he didn't need to continue to know more and and to refine his, his presentation and to be able to speak the gospel more clearly. Paul made it a point to always preach Christ even when he preached it and no one believed and and they wanted to kill him for it. He kept preaching Christ. So in these opening words, in this preface to Paul's profession, his presentation here, he complimented Agrippa. So he was happy to be there and to make his defense, and especially because you're an expert in all the customs and questions among the Jews. He complimented him and then asked him to be patient and to listen to him carefully. Paul knew, although it wasn't his words that would save, but that the, that the Spirit works through the preaching of the gospel. And so he wanted him to hear it. He wanted him to be patient. And he wanted him to listen carefully. He wanted all of them to listen carefully. His his compliment to Agrippa uh, probably played a role in Agrippa's willingness to listen patiently. And since Paul is speaking directly to the king, we can be sure that everyone else present is listening carefully and patiently as well. The king is being addressed. So you don't have people standing all around chattering. They're listening as well. And Paul knows this. And so he wants to give a clear and precise gospel presentation. So this brings us to our next point, verses 4 through 8. Paul begins by giving his... Uh, history, his upbringing. This point is Paul's pious pedigree. In verses 4 through 5, so Paul begins by giving a succinct account of his upbringing and his uh, religious history, emphasizing his past as a devout Pharisaic Jew educated in Jerusalem. Elsewhere, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, uh, regarding this, his background, his pedigree, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. In Acts 22, 3, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus born of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, in Jerusalem, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. And in chapter 23, verse 6, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope in the resurrection of the dead. So Paul begins by giving his Jewish heritage And once Paul was converted, he never considered his Jewish heritage to be in conflict with Christianity. Paul is standing before Agrippa and the crowd there this day as a follower of Jesus with a clear conscience. He had not abandoned his faith. He knows that he has not abandoned true Judaism. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul wrote there, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did. So Paul never considered 
following Christ to be in conflict with true Judaism. And so, in verse 6, after he described his past as a devout Jew, Paul makes the transition to the present. He says, this was my upbringing, I was this, and, and now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. So after he described his uh, past as a devout Jew, Paul makes the transition to the present with the word now. He asserts that the only reason that he is on trial is because he believes the promise made by God of a resurrected Savior. Verse 8 makes clear that he is referring to the, uh, to the resurrection when he says there, Why is it considered incredible among you if God does raise the dead? So what is this promise? I'm standing on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our Father. Speaking of the patriarchs, forefathers, the promise made to Abraham. God told Abraham to take his only son, the child of promise, up to Mount Moriah. Now, now we know that, 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 that literally, physically, Isaac was not Abraham's only son. He also had Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the son of the promise. Ishmael was the son of the flesh. So God could say, take your son, your only son, Isaac, as the child of promise. Take him up to Mount Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice. So in obedience, Abraham did. He began the journey. And when he saw the place on Mount Moriah, Abraham told his servants that were traveling with him to wait. He said, you wait here. The lad and I, Isaac and I, will return. That they would go up to the mountain. And Abraham knows he's going up there to offer Isaac. But he says, the lad and I will return. When Isaac asks on the way up, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where's the lamb, the sacrifice? Abraham answered, God will provide. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19 explains, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, it was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And then in Genesis 22, verse 14, it says there, Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, in the mount of Yahweh, it will be provided. About a thousand years later, Solomon would build the temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. And then about a thousand years after that, Jesus, the true Son, the only begotten of the Father, the true Son of promise, would be offered up as the sacrifice to pay for the sins of all who would ever believe on the promise. And He would rise again on the third day. And all who believe on Him from the beginning of time until He returns would be partakers of Him in the promise. standing on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers.
We go on to verse 7. Paul points out that this promise is what the twelve tribes hope to attain. The dispute that the unbelieving Jews had with Paul was his conviction that Israel's hopes have become a reality in and through Jesus. The promise has been fulfilled. Specifically, one one commentator notes, the promise of a Savior who would bring about the authentic realization of the people of Israel as the children of the promise to Abraham. The promise has been fulfilled. The dispute wasn't that God had made the promise. The dispute is that Paul is preaching God has fulfilled the promise. He's brought us salvation, and that salvation is through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, despite their political reality, many of the Jews maintained the hope, and still do maintain the hope, that the promise would be fulfilled by a political Savior that would establish peace and prosperity in an earthly promised land. Sadly, right now, the Jews in Israel, with all of the turmoil and all the conflict that are going on, many of them are still looking for a Savior that will come and free them from the oppression of kingdoms of this earth. They've missed the Messiah. They have missed Christ. They do this neglecting the fact that Christ has come. Christ did not come to simply free His people from earthly oppression. And that's what they're looking for. They've rejected the Messiah. They've rejected Christ. Christ came to free His people from something much greater than earthly affliction. Christ came to free His people from their sins, regardless of nationality regardless of ethnicity. You know, we hear so much today about being on the side of Israel. Well, that's true. We should if we consider Israel to be what it truly is. True Israel is the church. Now, where should our concern be with the people of Israel? The same place that it should be with the people of Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and Lebanon and anywhere else that they would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and repent and believe. They've rejected Christ, and their only hope is to turn from Him. His promises, as we're going to see, the promises are for not a physical realm, not an earthly realm, but spiritual. They seem to forget, the Jews seem to forget or ignore verses like Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, not one of their, they're looking for a fulfillment of the promises, but Joshua 21 tells us that not one of the good promises which Yahweh had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. The earthly promises had been fulfilled. And in chapter 23, verse 14 of Joshua, Now behold, today I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which Yahweh your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. They were misguided. And many still are. The promises are not physical and earthy for a single nationality but the promises are spiritual, eternal, and heavenly for people of all nations. As God promised Abraham that through his seed, all the nations would be blessed. 
all nations. Galatians, and then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, makes this abundantly clear. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Christ. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with genealogies and nationalities. To, to be partakers of the promise to Abraham. If you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's descendants. You are true Israel, the church. Not replacement, not that the New Testament church replaced Israel, but, but continuation. The, the, the true church, the true Israel has always been the church. From the beginning of time, until Christ returns. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For as many as are the promises of God, in Him, meaning Christ, they are yes and amen. Therefore, also through Him is our amen to the glory of God through us. The promises are not for an earthly kingdom, for the nation of Israel. The promises are for an eternal kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth, uh, for, for true Israel, all of the people of God. That all of the promises are fulfilled in Christ. That's our hope. The hope of all people. Let me tell you this. There's not separate promises for one nation, and then uh, uh, and, and then others, something else for uh, the Gentile people. This distinction of Israel and the church is not biblical. It requires a separation of the church and uh, nation. God is no respecter of persons. Nationalities, ethnicities are meaningless. We see that also in Galatians. That in Him, that, that God is, that, that, that there's no male, no female, no slave, no free, no Jew, no Gentile. That meaning indiscriminately of race and uh, sex or ethnicity, God is saving peoples of all tribes, tongues, sexes. Uh, there is no distinction, no separation. God does not have stepchildren. God only has children. And the promises are for the church, for us, Jew and Gentile alike, for all believers in Christ. We'll point out again, Galatians 3.29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promises. The promises are are ours, regardless of ethnicity. And so Paul refers to the twelve tribes. There was no longer, so this explained this, there was no longer a people of Israel consisting of twelve tribes. There were still some of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin living in Judea, and some of the priestly line, the Levites, but the northern kingdom, all of the other tribes, had become a different people. They were the Samaritans. When they were exiled by Assyria, well, the, the Assyrian king, essentially, his purpose was to breed out the Jews of the northern kingdom, and he did that. And they, they became a, a contaminated ethnicity, the Jews believed. They were the Samaritans. This was a, 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 a crossbreed of of Israel and other nations, even you know, from Babylon and other places. They were considered unclean by the Jews in Judea. What Paul is referring to here, when he mentions the twelve tribes, he's referring to the end times day when all of God's people, when all of true Israel will be regathered. Edward Schnabel, in his commentary on Acts, notes this. Luke's readers know what Paul implies. The restoration 
of the people of Israel, symbolized by the figure 12, um, that, that has become a reality through that the restoration of the people of Israel, symbolized by the figure 12, has become a reality through the person and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth who had chosen 12 apostles who would take the good news of the arrival of God, uh, the arrival of God's rule to Israel and to the nations. We see this also in Revelation. When Revelation refers to the 144,000, it's you know, referring to 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. This is a representative number uh, that, that represents the the completion, the totality of true Israel, the church, not a literal number, not, you know, not that there's only 144,000 that would be saved. I mean, believe me, I would not be one of 144,000. You know, it is only by the grace of God that He's counted me upon uh, you know, uh, any of us among His number, the number of His children. And so, it's, so uh, He's pointing to a future eschatological end times regathering of the complete and true church and true Israel. And so, then Paul, with this verse, verse 8, he challenges the Jews who believe in the resurrection. Even an intellectually honest Sadducee could not deny it. He challenges them who believe to follow through on their conviction that they believed in the resurrection. If they believe that God raised the dead, then or that He will raise the dead, then they cannot, with a clear conscience, believe that Paul is guilty of crimes that merit execution. They all believe in the resurrection. Paul in preaching Christ crucified and risen, Paul was merely living out what they all claimed to believe. They all they, they would they would believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees would say that they didn't, but all the rest of the Jews would openly say they believed in the resurrection. Paul was merely living out what they all claimed to believe. And this is the root of the issue that the world and mere professing believers have with true followers of Jesus today. They have no problem with us saying that we believe something. But watch out if you actually live out what you say you believe. And this is what Paul did. Paul says, yes, I believe in the resurrection. It's clear from the Old Testament even. Daniel chapter 12, uh, it's clear. And Paul says, I, not only do I believe in the resurrection, but, but it's happened. Christ is risen. Christ was crucified and He's risen from the grave. He is the first fruits. The problem was not believing in the resurrection. The problem was that He was actually preaching that it had occurred and He was living according to that. That's the problem that the world has with Christians today. That's the problem that mere professing believers have with those who seek to follow Christ obediently today is actually living out what Scripture says. You can say you believe it, but don't actually preach and live holiness. Don't actually hold to the standards of Scripture. Don't actually hold to Matthew 18 that requires and prescribes church discipline. Just keep going about your own business. I'll go about mine. You worry about you. I'll worry about me. When you preach and live in obedience to God's Word, that's when the persecution will begin. And so Paul continues with our last point. Paul was a previous persecutor. He points out then who he was and what he had done. Paul had spoken about his background as a uh, devout Jew and then about his present belief of Christ crucified and resurrected. And now he returns to the past 
and speaks of his prior persecution of Christians. And Paul even did these things. All the things that he had done to Christians, locked them up, put them in prison. He had done those things with a clear conscience as well. He thought he was following God. He thought that he was being pleasing to God. He was convinced that he ought to do many things against Jesus. That is, until he actually met Jesus on his way to Damascus. Paul went as far as saying that he had locked up many saints in prison and was even complicit in the murder of Christians. Paul seethed with anger toward those who professed Christ, torturing them and pursuing them, seeking them out. He wasn't just he wouldn't just persecute a Christian if he just if one just happened to come across his path. He was seeking them out to persecute them. He was a hunter of Christians. And he was on his way to Damascus with his hunting license signed by chief priests. That is, he did these things until he met Jesus, which we'll see next week. Paul went from the greatest persecutor to the greatest preacher of Jesus. This is who we all once were. Whether we acted on it, like Paul, or feigned love for God while walking in disobedience, also like Paul. Whether we were like Martin Nemo, and we're just silent in the face of evil. In the end, all they could say about Paul, the only charge that they had against him, was he preached Christ, crucified and risen. Imagine that they would, you will see when we come to the end of the, his testimony as we've read already. Paul, you're crazy. You're a lunatic. You're out of your mind. Much like disgustedly saying in the, in the account of Martin Niemöller. Imagine nine years in Nazi prison and all he can talk about is Jesus Christ. In the end, all they could say about Paul was just that. He preached Christ. And he continued to preach Christ. Wouldn't it be great if that's all that the world can have to say about us? If the only criticism that they have about us, that we're those people who just keep going around preaching Christ, that we're those people who no matter what happens, no matter what's happening in our lives and in our circumstances, they just preach Christ. They just continue to proclaim Him, to proclaim God and His goodness and His faithfulness. Oh, what a great testimony that would be. Just to be, just to be hated by the world because we preach Christ, because we're obedient to our God. May God work that in us. May that be our testimony. They just preach Christ. Amen. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You for Christ. We thank You for His faithfulness. We thank You for His enduring persecution and suffering to the end. Lord, and He did not concern His own comfort as greater than our need of His salvation, of His atonement. 
Father, let us follow Him obediently in the same way. We thank You for the example that we have in the apostles and in Paul. Lord, who suffered with Christ, who was persecuted just as He was, and continued to walk in faithfulness, continue to preach Christ. Father, may we not be intimidated. May we not be afraid. May we just preach Jesus. Lord, may we not be concerned about our acceptance and popularity on this earth. May we not be concerned with our own comforts. But may we just keep preaching Christ. So that God, on that day when He returns, to gather His people, to gather His elect, to gather true Israel, those who are children of the promise through faith in Christ, descendants of Abraham, children of the promise. That God, that we would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, may we live for that. In Jesus' name, amen.